first talk is resolving policy conflicts in multi-carrier cellular access. This will be delivered by uh, a PhD student from UCLA, Zheng Wen Yuan. He's a fourth year PhD student in computer science. His research interests include 4G, 5G, and IoT networks with a focus on low latency network design. And um, he's passionate about building and hacking mobile systems. And his hobby is landscape photography. So with that, I will let uh, Zheng, Wan, uh, Zheng Wen uh, talk about his work on cellular networks. Yeah, thank you, Karthik, for the introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Zheng Wen Yuan. I'm from UCLA Computer Science. Uh, I'm a fourth year PhD student. Um, I think if you could pull up my slides. No. Yeah. So today I'm really pleased to introduce you our latest work on resolving the policy conflicts in multi-carrier cellular access. This is a joint work with my colleagues Qian Ru, Yuan Jie, my advisor Sang Wu, and Professor Peng from Chen Yi and Professor Verghese from UCLA. So first of all, what is multi-carrier cellular access? Um, in short, it's a service that gives you the free access to multiple carriers with just one SIM card. So ideally, the phone can automatically switch to a carrier that gives you good service. There are a lot of industry products that offer this kind of service, including Apple SIM, Samsung eSIM, and Google Project Fi. And among them, the Project Fi is really a leading effort. Sorry about this slide. So Google Project Fi is really the leading efforts uh, in providing such nice device-based solution. Um, how it really works, right? Why people want to use the multi-carrier cellular access? Um, excuse me. Um, yeah. Because it has many benefits. Among them, it provides better service qualities without any infrastructure upgrade. So you only need to have the service on your phone and the SIM card installed so that you can combine the better carrier service from multiple carriers. For example, it's easy to understand that single carrier may not give you the better service anywhere, anytime. Like I may have a good service from T-Mobile in my home, but not so much at my work. And the Sprint could just be the opposite of that. So what if we can combine these two so that we can get LT anywhere we go? So that's exactly what the multi-carrier cellular access is providing. Um, for that. Um, it seems there's some glitch in the control. Can you please turn to the next slide? Yeah. Um, can you go to the next? Yeah, sorry about the technical difficulties. Um, what I want to show here is that um, you can select to the T-Mobile LT at your home, but when it goes to the work, the T-Mobile only have the 3G coverage. And uh, Sprint has just the opposite of that. Okay. Yeah, could you please just help me turn to the next? Yes, please turn to the next. Um, Yeah, could you please just turn to the next and next until we see the next slide? Okay, yeah, sorry about that. So how does the multi-carrier cellular access uh, really works? Okay, thank you so much. So at the high level, it's really uh, simple. It has a two-tiered selection process. First of all, if you, let's say you're a Project Fi user, the first step you would do is to select the carrier among the multiple choices that are available. So for example, you want to use T-Mobile service. So the Project Fi actually configures your SIM card to, with a T-Mobile uh, profile. So you can connect to the T-Mobile and that is regulated by the, what we call intercarrier policy. Then after you connect to T-Mobile, you follow the T-Mobile's intercarrier policy to select the serving cell. So in this two-tiered process, you can see uh, it's, it's really simple. Just follow this process and you can get a service. 
In this process, the two policies involved are the intercare policy and the intracare policy. The intercare policy is defined and operated by the multi-carrier service providers, such as Google. And the goal is very simple, just choosing the appropriate carrier, for example, which has 4G service. As for the intracare policy, it is really the legacy uh, uh, carrier practice. It is operated and kept within each carrier. For example, maybe you know about the cellular handout priority. That's one example of the intracare policy. Note that the intracare policy details may not known by a multi-carrier service provider such as Google because these are the operational secrets from each carriers. In this work, we make a case for the, the, the policy-based switching for the multi-carrier cellular access because, first of all, it's the de facto practice used by Google Project Fi and other multi-carrier service um, products. And it's really seen in most of the operational networks like cellular handoff, like the BGP routing, and it has nice properties. Technical-wise, it gives you the flexibility and scalability to operate the network. And you can also encode the non-technical con considerations by using these policies. But regardless of these nice properties, conflicts could happen if you use the intercarrier policies. So let's look at this example. Initially, assume you are connected in T-Mobile 3G and the intercarrier policy is really simple. It just wants to move you to a carrier which gives you LTE service. So you will switch from T-Mobile to Sprint to seek for LTE. But unfortunately, here in Sprint, the intercarrier policy um, says that, no, I want you to move to the business small cell I set up here, which is unfortunately a 3G cell. Then the intercarrier policy is violated and it has to switch back again to T-Mobile because it wants the LTE service. Unfortunately, in T-Mobile, again, because the LTE cellular tower is signal is weak and you have to move from the LTE to 3G, and there you can see there's a loop. Actually, that was just an illustrative example, but we find that through our theoretical analysis, there's more. The persistent loop can happen even under static cases. That is, you don't move, you don't have the mobility, and the network conditions are not changing, and the intercarrier policies are unchanged and deterministic. So it's quite surprising to see the loop happens. And once it happens, it's really bad. Because first of all, the negative impact on the phone is non-negligible. It has tens of seconds service disruption. It has three times power consumption, and all of that are magnified by the frequent occurrence of such loop because it's persistent. And the worst is that this is a design issue. It's rooted in the design of this two-tier selection. It's not an implementation bug. So in this work, we aim to answer these two questions. First of all, what are the intercarrier policies we can see? And second, if we can find these loops, how can we resolve them? So in answering these two questions, we made the following contributions. First, we identified the intercarrier policy loops and we laid down the theoretical framework to analyze the loop conditions, and we further validate these, these loops existence using the operational Google Project Fi. In answering how to resolve these loops, we further uh, proposed the practical guidelines, and we finally conducted experiments to validate the effectiveness. Now, let me um, guide you through our uh, main results. So, in the following talk, I'm going to show you first what is the common policies for intercarrier policy and what are the loop conditions. After that, I'm going to show you the real cases we found in Project Phi, and after that, how can we propose guidelines to solve them and our evaluation. So first, about the policies. Actually, because the intercarrier policy has not been standardized, we start from the common policy practice of the real networks. So there are preference-based policies, threshold-based policies, and to make this framework comprehensive, there's hybrid of these two. Actually, in each category, we have further subcategories. Due to the sake of time, I'm going to show you two cases. So first, let's look at one example in intercarrier uh, preference-based policy. So in preference-based policy, you assign a preference on the certain target carrier and its radio technology. For example, if it's 3G or 4G. Just like the uh, policy example, uh, policy assignment table on the right. So you do the carrier switching if you find there's another carrier which has a higher preference combination. So the loop could happen just as the example I showed you earlier. 
And the observation here is really that the intercarrier policy is always trying to move you to 4G, whereas the intracarrier policy, they cannot satisfy. They always move you to 3G. So intuitively, these loop conflicts happen because the preference set by these two policies are not consistent. They conflict with each other, right? And our theoretical analysis validated this intuition. Basically, in the paper, we have a theorem proving that the persistent carrier loop may happen if both conditions are uh, satisfied. That is, the intercar policy always try to assign a preference that is the same and highest one in each carrier, but in each carrier, the intercar policy cannot satisfy and move you to another radio technology. So we validate this uh, current in Project Phi just to give you a little bit of uh, background on how Project Phi works. Project Phi actually follows the uh, policy-based switching. It has the backend server that distributes this policy to the phone, so the phone at runtime could rewrite the SIM card and change the profile so the phone switched to another carrier. If we look a bit closer on how the Project Phi executes this policy, it actually follows this controller monitor architecture. There are multiple monitors. Each one is responsible for certain policy attributes. In this example, the network type monitor is going to say, I want, to you, I want you to switch to 4G as long as the carriage is available. So in fact, we, we, do, we did find the loops in Project Phi looping between the T-Mobile and Spring at every approximately 10 minutes. Um, actually, Google is not that stupid, right? Google is actually doing a very good job. It tries to eliminate such loop by uh, posing a lockdown timer during this switch. But obviously, there's still two downsides. First of all, that the phone is stuck. It cannot really make any changes, thus losing the flexibility in selecting a better carrier. And second of all, it's not a fundamental solution because it just prolongs the loop interval, but not eliminating the loop. OK, so that's the first category. Let me uh, quickly guide you through another category. Um, that is the threshold-based policy. Using threshold-based policy, Let's look at this example. So the intercarrier policy is trying to dictate and select a, car a, a, a carrier which gives you lower latency. For example, if the latency is high, then I want to move to another carrier. However, the intercarrier policy just uses the existing criteria that is based on the signal strength and the cell priorities. And intuitively, we can still find the loops showing this figure. So the intercarrier policy try to move you from T-Mobile to Spring because it thinks that T Spring could give you lower latency. But unfortunately, as the, T as the Spring always move you to a cell that is higher latency, you want to move back to T-Mobile by the intercarrier policy. So still, you have the loop. And intuitively, this loop happens because the different measures used by these two policies, they don't, come, they don't reach the same conclusion on which carrier gives you the best service. And we did have a theorem on that as well. Um, it's uh, essentially telling you that if the intercar policy is not selecting the minimum matrix considered by the intercar policy, then the loop is not avoidable. And similarly, we did find that in Project Phi, you have the loop. It's caused by a machine learning module in Project Phi because it tries to evaluate at the runtime which carrier may give you better service. In doing that, it's using cross-sourcing data, which is gathered by this latency and throughput. But they are orthogonal. They are independent to the matrix the intracarrier policies are using, which are the signal strength and the priorities. So these two could conflict, and that's the loop we found. Again, Google has some remedies. Like, they try to limit the, the number of times you do the switch. But, but again, it's, it's just not a fundamental solution. Right? So the third category actually is a hybrid of these two. We combine them together. And for the sake of time, please read our papers for the details. Now we have this theoretical analysis on the loops. How can we eliminate them? Well, if we look back at this example, for example, for the preference-based policy, what we can do here? The goal is to achieve stability, that is, eliminating the loop. But the constraint we have here is we cannot do anything about the intracarrier policy because that's not operated by us, which is multi-carrier service provider like Google. So the only thing you can do is basically you can revise your own policy, the intercarrier policy. And actually, that's what we started. We inspired by the BGP's solution. 
Uh, and in, in the meantime, we want to say, okay, can we do it without knowing all the intra carrier policy details? And also, can we still retain flexibility in, in choosing the carrier? Fortunately, we can. Um, so basically, you can see we can eliminate one of these two green links. And if we eliminate the bottom one, so essentially what we are doing here is we are changing the intercarrier policy preference to a new ordering. So after that, we can say if the phone switch from T-Mobile to Sprint, it's going to stay, but rather it's not going to fall into a loop. And similarly, we can um, use remove the top one to eliminate the loop. So we have a guideline on that. For the threshold-based policy, similar observations, and we follow the same guidelines. So basically, the conclusion we have reached was, first, do not use some criteria which is loop-prone, and second of all, try to consider the worst-case scenario in the target carrier when you try to switch to eliminate the loop. Uh, for the sake of time, I'm, uh, fortunately, I cannot go to the details, but please do read our paper if you're interested. And for the hybrid policy, essentially it's uh, combining these two and all the results still applies. So in the paper, we have guidelines to um, target all these scenarios. Last but not least, we conduct experiment uh, evaluations on the effectiveness of these guidelines. We crawl the project files real coverage data to set up the intercarrier policies, and we extracted the intercarrier policy configurations from the open source mobile insight data. Our, uh, our evaluation showed that they are effective in eliminating all the loops. So geographically, these loops can occur up to 6.16% for the preference-based policy and 5.8% for the um, threshold-based policy, and we can eliminate all of them. There has been some related works. Uh, first of all, the policy-based network, network configurations like BGP, SDN. Uh, our problem is different because the problem setting and the mechanism we approach is totally different the new proposals from 5G on HitNet and network slicing is trying to achieve similar goals to improve the user performance, but again, these are the infrastructure-based solutions, which is orthogonal to the user-based uh, device-based solution uh, we talk here. And further, it may have some policy issues that is similar. So in conclusion, multi-carrier access is a really nice paradigm that gives user better access, and Google Projectify is really the leading example from the industry how without ex upgrading infrastructure you can achieve that. But like everything else, it has some glitches. In this case is the carrier switching loops that is caused by the policy conflicts. So in this work, we laid down the first theoretical framework in analyzing how this loop may happen and how we can address them by proposing practical guidelines we believe that this work still applic uh, is applicable to the future 5G, and even the dual SIM context probably you've seen rising in the recent years, as long as they are moving towards this automatic switching among the carriers. Thank you. So our next talk in the session is uh, ECHO, a Reliable Distributed Cellular Core Network for Hyperscale Public Clouds. The talk will be uh, given by Bozidar Radunovic. So R Bozidar is a researcher in, the, in Microsoft Research at Cambridge. Uh, so he's been in the mobile space for a while now, and his interests are in the design and evaluation of computer systems and algorithms uh, with a specific interest in access networks. Uh, Bozidar obtained his PhD from EPFL in Switzerland and has since been, after his postdoc, has since been uh, with Microsoft Research. Okay, hopefully it works now. Um, so. Uh, thanks for the introduction again. This is a joint work with a bunch of collaborators from the University of Utah. In particular, Bin was uh, the lead uh, student author on the paper who unfortunately couldn't attend here for various uh, visa, visa, visa issues. So uh, he, was, he really did most of the work here. And we have Candy as well as a student, and then Ryan and Kobus from Utah, Thomas, who is my colleague there, and we have uh, Jakob from CND. So uh, let me first motivate this work. So uh, this is about... Uh, cellular core, and uh, for those of you who may not know what the cellular core is and still sit in the session, this is basically a software and hardware that runs your phones and controls your phones and base stations and everything on the cellular. And uh, typically these things run on um, telco cloud, so these are sort of dedicated data centers built by tel telcos to operate uh, cellular core and other things, and typically they would have most of them still operate in, uh, you know, hardware boxes that you buy and, and are built to be reliable and performant and so on. And some of those that are virtualized, they use different sort of 
L2 virtualization, to do uh, to, to replication, to make sure you can have a replication between different systems. So uh, the benefit is they are built to be reliable, but the downside is they're expensive. You need to have your own uh, infrastructure for that, and also you know it's difficult to scale and and, and it's difficult to uh, to 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 um, sort of add more workload and so on. So the question we're posing here is. Um, can we run these kind of appliances, the, the tel telco core, on a hypercloud? And so the obvious benefit is it's much more affordable. So suppose you want to run your own cellular core network, and we have an application that I'll discuss at the very end. You want to build your own cellular network. Uh, do you have to build your own data center, right? And, and if you want to run it in another country, do you, can you actually rely on the existing infrastructure? And then how do you scale it? Can you actually add more workload and so on? And so obviously the nice thing about a hypercloud is that you can add more VMs, you can add more services there. There's also uh, L3, uh, sort of load balancing, which allows you much uh, more flexibility in scheduling of workloads. But the problem is you have to make it reliable. So typically these systems have to run on multiple VMs or containers. They have to do some sharing the states and so on. So this talk is really about how can you design a reliable network in this setting, which will be affordable and reliable to support to support these uh, requirements, right? So, in a bit more details, what a cellular core is, basically, or what a cellular system is. If you look at a picture here, so on the left hand side we have your phone, which in the jargon is called UE. And in the middle we have your base stations, which are called ENODs or whatever you use. And then on the right hand side there are a bunch of boxes, which I'm not going to describe in details, but these boxes are basically receiving communication from your phone and from your base station and communicate between themselves and doing different control and data plane stuff, maybe opening a connection for you or forwarding your packets and so on. So in an example, for if you want to start your phone call or you want to start your data communication, first the phone is going to send a request, maybe you press on a button on a browser to open your data plane if it has been closed. So then this first message here comes, uh, let's see if this works. So here down there is a first message coming from your phone to this core network, and then inside this message is going to generate other messages which are communicating between these boxes. And you don't really need to know what these messages are, but that one message can generate another message and another message. In this case, we have like three one in sequences. And here the resolution is not great, but you can see that one of these messages failed. So what we also have are some timers, and there are some timeouts. If a message fails, something has to resend the message. Uh, and so then they also reply. So eventually some of these boxes will start replying and you get replies and once this all finishes, you will have your session open for your data to go through. So if you kind of abstract that and look for the high level, this is a sort of distributed state machine where you have lots of um, messages that happen. And so basically there's a request from a client that starts this whole thing. And then you have, you have what we call side effects when one message creates another message. These messages kind of propagate until they finish your transaction. At the end of the day, you know, you get your message, you, you get your, your connection open. So the key thing here is to have a consistent state across all of these boxes and also across what your phone sees. And that's a sort of unique difference between, you know, a lot of distributed state machine in the sort of system literature, but you also need to coordinate that with, uh, with your phone, right? So the phone has to see the same message there. Uh, so, uh, so why is this important? I'm going to give you two quick examples. What can happen if you don't do that in a good way? So in this particular example here, this is all run in our testbed on a real kind of setup. Uh, what happens is on the left-hand side, we have a phone that started opening this connection. And the right-hand side is one of the elements, MME. That it's a part of this core network, which basically sort of gets an attached message, which means you want to talk. And then it kind of loses its state, re reboots, for example, right? So what happens is that because it doesn't have a state, it now when it reboots, it starts with a fresh empty state and keeps rejecting all your data packets. But the phone doesn't know about that event of reboot, so the phone keeps dropping all your messages. And what happens here is for 54 minutes, there is no event that will trigger recovery of the network on its own. You will just lose packets unless you do something. So there is some event that comes at every 54 minutes which will recover your packet. But basically, it's a pretty bad event, right? So even if you have a low probability of this event, your disruption is quite bad. So you want to make sure it almost never happens. Another example, which typically happens in distributed systems of this kind, is you want to have message ordering. So one other thing that can happen, and again, this is in our uh, sort of testbed uh, reproduction, is a phone maybe detaches, means dis disconnects, and then connects afterwards. But imagine that happened that these two attach and detach messages went took different paths. And so on the right-hand side in the core, they swap the order. So what happens, the 
first uh, the network processed the attach message, said, well, this guy's already attached, so I just ignore it. And then went to the attach message and disconnected it. Whereas at this point, the phone thinks it's connected. So again, this kind of different ordering caused a 54 minutes disruption. So the key thing here is in this distributed state machine with a state on a client as well, how do we manage these transactions? How do we manage this state? And how do we manage this timer in an unreliable deployment? I mean, I don't mean to say that these data centers are unreliable, but you have to design your software around them to avoid these bad kind of events. So this talk is about how to design this core network for a public cloud. And so I'm just going to go over key observations that influence our design, and then a little bit about the design. <laughs> So the first observation is that the access points, the base stations are reliable, because if an access point fails, you won't have any connectivity anyway, right? Because that's your kind of anchor, wireless anchor. So the second thing is that um, the transaction ends when all the components are updated. So if you want to make sure that, sorry, that, you, that your uh, phone has the same state, you need to make sure that all the components done their processing before you kind of update the phone. And then uh, another observation is that uh, these transactions are uh, there are a lot of users, so they're actually inherently parallel. So if you serialize transactions per user, you will not affect the performance lo a lot because they kind of um, don't, there are not so many transactions per user. And finally, the times out also have to be transactions. If something times out, you have to run it in serial, otherwise you can have a weird reordering like we've seen pre before. So in a nutshell, in one slide, our design, so basically, you know, we have um, a sort of we, we say, well, then the base station is going to be our reliable entry point, which is going to serialize and deal with the transaction that I'll, I'll describe in a minute. And then on the right-hand side, we have uh, the usual sort of design for the cloud, where you have like multiple uh, stateless, element, sta stateless elements, and you have a, like a reliable storage. So the key difference here is that we have essentially an, a reliable entry point that provides these transactions with, uh, with their timestamps and, and, and serializes them. And then the rest is, as I said, sort of fairly straightforward and, and then make sure that transactions are arced and sort of uh, uh, applied continuously. So in a very simple walkthrough, if a client sends a message, first this message is received by this base station, which, is, which has our software running on it. So then it's queued there and it's queued there until it's finished, right? So then this triggers a message to the core network and it propagates through the core network, whatever the software may do, right? So the message propagates. And once the, the, message, the replies start coming back, when the replies are processed, so for example, this guy one will send the response only when he got all the answers from all the responses before that, and only then it will be acknowledged to the entry point. And once that is done, the entry point knows now that this message is sort of finished, and then it can be announced back to the client, and also can be removed from the queue, because now this transaction is finished. So um, we can, we, with this kind of design, we can prove a lot of properties and the details are in the paper. These are all sort of obvious properties you want to have from this kind of distributed system. Monotonicity, that you will not process an old obsolete request. Atomicity, that the transactions are serialized in the right way. Then uh, idempotence, that if you apply different, many times the same transaction, nothing will happen. And similarly, like they will eventually complete because they're timers, they will expire. Sorry for the details, I'll, I'll let you look in the paper. Uh, and then I have to come back to the entry point design, where basically we now said we want to modify the entry point. So that was a, a sort of imposed decision also because these base stations today use um, uh, SCTP, which is a, a protocol often used in telecom rather than TCP. Uh, and all the sort of the, the cloud level stuff uses TCP. So we kind of, to, to make the full use of cloud, we have to make a, a transition, translation from SCTP to TCP. So and then we also build a client that runs as a sort of user level daemon on top of it without modifying any software. It's very easy to deploy. And also the small cells manage sort of the biggest macro cell have 250 clients simply because you know you have a lot of uh, radio operations to operate there. So if you just add this software of ours, which is very low uh, CPU overhead, it, you don't even notice it on those. <laughs> and so it does what I said, timeouts, uh, serialization and so on. So in general, if you look at the design, so the overall thing, so on the right-hand side, you have the architecture. Left of the line is the base station. The right is the data center. The red blocks are the ones we added. So on the left-hand side, we added this, this daemon on, on Linux that just translates these messages and adds serialization. On the right-hand side, in the existing um, uh, EPC design, we used OpenEPC. We just added the, the thing that serialized without touching much of the rest of the, the EPC. So, and then, of course, we have to have some uh, state, persistent state. We chose ZooKeeper. You can use anything you want. 
and, uh, and essentially uh, it's only 1,400 lines of code to implement that without really modifying much of the system. So a little bit about evaluation. Uh, so what we did then, so we deployed this fully uh, on, uh, on IP access small cell where we deployed the client. We used OpenEPC as a core network and Nexus phones for, for testing. And then we also tried two different deployments. <clears throat> One is where we replicate the state across three VMs in the same data center, in the same Azure data center. And then we have uh, the second one where we replicate across three different data centers. So maybe you use West US and West US 2 and Central US. So these data centers are further apart, so there's much more latency, but it's more reliable. And here we don't advocate one or the other. We just evaluate the two ones, right? For if you really crave about a lot of reliability, you may use three data centers. Otherwise, one is probably good enough. And, and here we focus on control plane. We didn't evaluate data plane. It's sort of, uh, we didn't modify it really. So if you look at, at uh, so here we give the, the top line open EPC is a baseline. And then we have uh, 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 three ways of echo. So basically echo with memory means we don't store on disk. Uh, and there's a disk asynchronous and, synch and disk synchronous. So uh, asynchronous means we write, but we don't wait for it. So there's less latency. Uh, and and uh, so if you see that we do introduce some more latency because you have to wait for response for all of them. But in, in addition to that latency that was added on network and radio processing, it's pretty small. <laughs> and uh, so this is for a touch and service request. And then if you look at the three data centers, Obviously, because the now messages have to go across uh, uh, probably uh, uh, several hundred kilometers, that adds more latency. Uh, but still, it's sort of maybe at most 30, I think, uh, summary, maybe at most 30% increase in latency uh, for three data centers. For one, it's sort of around 10%. So um, basically, um, even if you want to have this extra reliability, three data centers is still sort of in uh, some reasonable bounds. And so what does it mean, reasonable bound? So here, uh, on the figure here, we plot the same things as a CDF, and on the right-hand side is a timeout that is required by 3GPP. So, as you can see, even if you reproduce, even if you do replicate on three data centers, your, your, your timeout is still like two orders of magnitude away. So you have enough, you will not breach the timeout because of this replication, but you get this um, secure deployment. And finally, we, we compare it with the user-perceived latency. So. We basically did the same experiment on T-Mobile network in the US and compared with our network. And so you see that for a touch request, the T-Mobile network actually happens to be slower, probably because they have some different network infrastructure behind which we don't have. But on the, on the sort of service request, which is for every uh, request you make, uh, the T-Mobile is uh, faster, although there's a lot of variance. But you think about it, this is when you first open your browser and start browsing, and that's when you do that. Like every next session which comes within the half and uh, with, without 30 seconds uh, idleness will still be in the same section. So you probably even won't notice this. So overall, I mean, it's a very little uh, perception from the user side uh, for the technique we introduced. And so we have a, fake, a quick illustration of failure scenario. Now, this is one failure induced on the open EPC network. And then the same failure, in our case, will simply continue because we have all the states saved. <clears throat> and so finally, just a, a, a last minute. So we have actually deployed this in the real network. And uh, we have, and, and so that's, that illustrates nicely the application you can do with this one. Uh, so we have, uh, so we were serving a community in, in Cambridge in the UK, and we've deployed the network with uh, five base stations and about 40 users. We ran it over two years. And uh, uh, we, have, uh, we have not run the fully virtualized MME there, but we run our EPC, our, our uh, base station client on the base station. And the reason is that actually the failures on the, cloud was much less prevalent than the failures in the links. So it was sufficient to run this only on the client and be able to repeat the transaction on the client and still have a fully reliable network. But that was sort of operational for two years and, um, and, and we had some great. So um, yeah, I'll be happy to talk about this afterwards. So this, this finishes uh, the talk. Basically, <clears throat> um, as a summary, we build this um, EPC, which is cloud native and uh, which is able to sort of replicate the state and be reliable. And the main design <clears throat> takeaways are that we have proactive replication, so we replicate the state every time to make sure when the failure happens, we only have a state to serve it. And then another, uh, probably the key design point is that the uh, base stations are uh, reliable. So if you instrument the base station, the rest of the design is really simple. And so the key thing here is to make it simple and affordable. And then uh, because the load scales the number of users, you can actually serialize without much consequences per user. And um, so, and I think the key thing that we liked about it is that it enables you to use the cellular technologies, many other scenarios like, you know, our 
uh, our TY space testbed or, or you know, community networks where thinking of buying your own cellular core would be out of reach. But if you can deploy on a cloud like this, you know, it can actually make some of these things uh, happen. And this is, we have a link with more uh, details. I'll be happy to answer some questions. If you have some, otherwise Karthik will have to ask again. <laughs> Thank you. So thanks, Bozidar. Uh, so let's move on. Uh, let's thank the speaker again, and then we can move on to the next talk. So the next talk uh, will be given by Anna Maria. Uh, the title of her presentation is Experience of uh, Implications of Roaming in Europe. Uh, and just to give you some background, Anna Maria is finishing up a PhD at University of Carlos Madrid under the prestigious European Marie Curie program and she's moving to Imperial College London as a research associate in November. And her research interests are quite vast, ranging from TCP middle boxes to, uh, to internet measurements and also other measurement platforms. And she's worked as an intern for Telefonica Research and similar metropolitan in Norway as well. So without much delay, uh, let's hear from her. Okay, thank you. Um, let's talk about uh, our experience measuring uh, roaming in Europe. First of all, I would like to thank uh, uh, Andra Luto, my co-author and also mentor in this project, for the amazing work. Thank you, Andra. She is in the audience. Um, so uh, I will talk about motivations and uh, um, what moved us to measure roaming in Europe, some little background, and uh, the experimental setup, the actual uh, measurement platform we use invented to measure roaming in Europe. The measurements we made, uh, we make uh, three uh, main contributions in terms of measurements. We study the roaming setup and performance, the traffic differentiation in roaming, so VoIP, and some content discrimination. And then the actual roaming results in these three uh, fields. And since this is an experience, uh, uh, paper. Uh, I will talk about our experience building this platform and how we created the data set and uh, process it. So, motivation. Um, Romnico is the initiative of the European Union to levy the extra charges while roaming in Europe. It means that finally, since June 2017, you can roam in Europe for free. It means that you can use the data plan you have in your home country in the foreign country. If you are in Italy and you are traveling to Spain, you can do free call uh, in the other country, in the entire Europe, including the Norway, UK. But the motivation, why study, uh, why actually study roaming in, uh, in Europe? So first of all, we would like to understand the roaming ecosystem after this new initiative of the European Union. Secondly, uh, the questions we would like to answer are which technical solution are actually be used? Uh, which is the roaming configuration that mobile network operators are using for roaming? And the third one, what are the implications of roaming uh, for, for the hand users? So what is uh, the experience, the delay uh, that the user can experience while roaming? But first, let's talk about a little bit about the background so uh, this is a um, standard network infra uh, mobile infra infrastructure. And uh, the standard is that you are at home, and then you are using your home infrastructure. While you're roaming, you can have three different configurations. So the first one is that you are using the mobile network operator can opt for home routed roaming. It means that you are using the infrastructure. So if, while you're roaming, you're using the infrastructure that is at your home. You're using the P gateway at your home country. The other configuration is the uh, local breakout. It means that you are using the infrastructure or you, the visited network, the one in the country where you are, uh, when, where you are roaming. And the third one is uh, uh, the IPX hub breakout. It means that you are using a third party infrastructure. Let's talk about the core of our paper, that is the experimental setup and uh, the roaming Moro platform. So first of all, why you think uh, of uh, this kind of measurements? 
um, you think how you can measure this, right? So um, you think that you can distribute uh, mobile phones all around rural Europe and give to n normal users, I mean, and uh, this, of course, is difficult because you, you, how you can schedule the measurements, how you can synchronize them. So what we decide to do is build a measurement platform for roaming. This platform is developed in six different countries, Norway, Sweden, uh, UK, uh, Germany, Spain, and Italy. So we have six, uh, we have 12 different uh, roaming nodes, and we have a backend system composed by servers that collects all the measurements, and then we have one measurement server for each country we cover, and we have a model roaming scheduler that is the core of our platform that synchronizes, schedule the measurements simultaneously. So the, we collect measurements for three months in uh, end 2017 and beginning 2018. And uh, we have 12 nodes in each of the country we cover, 16 mobile network operators, and uh, we, exper we collect more than 20,000 experiments. We measure one mobile network operator per time, uh, all synchronized. And also, we measure the uh, nightly visited network when possible. I will explain this uh, later. For example, let's say we, are, we want to measure Vodafone Germany. So from Germany, we send manually by standard mail, all the SIM cards to the other country. And what we do, this is our platform. So the scheduler, basically we put the home SIM card, in this case Vodafone Germany in Germany, in Germany, in the node in Germany. So just the home SIM. In the other country, we not only measure Vodafone Germany, but we also measure the SIM, the mobile network operator, where the SIM is camping on. So let's say that you are measuring Vodafone Germany in Italy, then this one will camp in Vodafone Italy, and we measure also Vodafone Italy simultaneously with the other nodes. But let's see in details the measurements we did. So the first one is about measuring roaming setup and performance. So we basically uh, collect all the radio metadata, where the roaming sim is camping on in that moment, the time when it was connected, the time when it was lo losing the connection, for example. The second measurement we did is trace route and ping to our own measurement server in the all countries. And then we measure DNS, and in the end, uh, Carl performs against 10 different uh, popular web services, for example, the top 10 Alexas. Let's see the results about this uh, roaming setup. So uh, we, was, we, we were really surprised because we discovered that all the mobile network operators use home-routed uh, roaming. It means that the packet go back and forth to home before to go to the, to the, to the country where the server is. Let's do an example about this. So let's say that I'm Vodafone Germany and I'm in Germany. And I wanted to, and I wanted to access content in Germany. So this is the round trip time, the time experience. Let's say that now I'm always in Germany, and I wanted to connect to UK. Of course, the round trip time is bigger because it's far away. Okay. Now I'm roaming in Germany. I'm from UK, and I want to connect to the server in Atom, so a server in UK. In this case, this is the round trip time. And surprisingly, the GTP tunnel is lower than the internet tunnel when you are roaming and you're going home. The worst case is when you want to connect in the country, you want to uh, download content in the country where you are roaming. In this case, the packet has to go back and forward. So uh, basically, you lost a lot of time and you have de uh, delay penalties. For example, you are in India, and you have a SIM card from Italy, and you want to access uh, the uh, times uh, of India. In this case, you have to go back home, the packets will go back to Italy, and then uh, download the content from the server that is local in India. Okay? 
So you have the delay penalty in this case. We did the same with DNS, and uh, we found the same thing because it's home rooted uh, configuration. So as you can see mm, in the figure, in, when you are at home, of course, you have less query times than when you are roaming. Uh, apart from uh, measurements uh, performance, uh, apart from uh, measuring the performance and setup, we also measuring we also measure uh, VoIP and traffic differentiation. So uh, we emulate uh, FaceTime, Messenger, and WhatsApp traffic, and we connect from the roaming sim and from home uh, for measuring VoIP. And we also uh, take in consideration. Uh, um, Content discrimination. Uh, we use Uniprobe for web connectivity tests. Content discrimination means what happens uh, when you are uh, out, you want to access um, content that you can access locally when you are abroad. For example, you have Netflix at home and you have some movies that you you want to access roaming. So we actually test that when you are abroad you can access this content that you usually have at home. Um, being the home rooted roaming, the configuration that was by default the one for mobile network operators, uh, we didn't find any traffic differentiation uh, while roaming. Same for content discrimination. So for content discrimination, we match the content that we find at home with the content we find when we are roaming. And uh, we find no evidence of additional content discrimination in this case. And basically, the geo restriction has as a tom. If you cannot access uh, content at home, you cannot access, uh, access while, while roaming and the opposite. So mm, as an experience, uh, since this is an experienced people, I will tell you more about our experience in measuring this platform. Well, it was painful to synchronize all the measurements because of uh, a lot of people that, uh, a, lo a lot of countries that are involved in this project, so six countries, they means that in the same time, we had to ask people to change the team every week, every two weeks, based on the measurement we have to do in that moment. So we send mails, uh, smoke signals, <laughs> whatever, to synchronize. Um, another uh, thing was repurposing the moral, uh, readapting the moral code that is open source. Moral is a platform that was presented uh, last year in this same conference. Repurposing the moral code for our platform uh, was also difficult because uh, we need to adapt it for our roaming purpose. And the third thing, also taking care of the moral nodes was uh, quite, uh, was, wasn't quite simple because sometimes when you change themes, you have to reconfigure everything, reconfigure the ICC ID and other parameters that you need to uh, measure. So in conclusion, home routing home seem to be the norm for mobile network operators in, uh, in Europe. We ask, we talk with uh, the mobile network operators, we tested with some of them, and they say that it's the easy way, basically, because of the billing, because of the traceability of the traffic. And, uh, but of course, this brings delay penalty and potentially also a bad quality of experience of a user that is traveling. We didn't find any traffic differentiation in our measurements. This is in line, and no content discrimination, and this is in line with the uh, home rooted configuration. And for future work, we would like to go more in deep uh, on the quality of uh, experience of the user. So make real browser measurements, uh, for example, page load time, and whatever. So happy roaming to everybody. Thank you for listening. An important thing that I want to say is that the data set is open. Uh, we collect these 20,000 experiments. All the, you can connect to our roaming webpage and you can download the data whenever you want. Uh, we have the raw data, the parser data, all the parsers we use to parse the, to, to parse the data. And, uh, if you have any doubts on how to do it or how the data set looks like, then you can just write me or Andra. We will be happy to uh, help.
And uh, Moro, uh, Moro Roaming is an open project. You can use the platform if you have like uh, a nice uh, um, project. Then you can just write us and uh, we will happy to help with, with, with using the platform. So thank you. So our next speaker is Christina. So Christina is a PhD student with Netcom research team at universe, University of Carlos Madrid. I guess, so you're in the same university as the previous speaker. So we have two in the same session. Her research interests are in big data, data analytics, and mobile networks. She received her uh, Master of Science degree in telematics and telecommunications engineering uh, in 2017 and 18. And she's pursuing a PhD in the same field, in the same university. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, well, as I said, my name is Cristina, and I made this job, uh, this work, jointly with Marco, Marco, Albert, and also Xavi. And it is about network slicing. So first, let me introduce what network slicing is. This one. Sorry about this. It's not working. This one? Okay, no. So let me introduce what network slicing is. Um, in a network, uh, in a physical network infrastructure, we have different network nodes. And in there, we can define several uh, virtual instances by means of NFB. So we can have, NF we can have NFB virtualizing the different nodes as follows. And this, uh, for example, in the antenna or even in the cloud run data centers or even in the, uh, in the cloud core. So this uh, allows the operator to define customized services, customized network cap performance uh, indicators and dedicated resources. Each of one of, of these networks would be an slice. And the business model is that the operator can then reserve tailored uh, tailor slices to tenants, which is a specific services. But they don't, have, they don't need to be end-to-end. -end. They could be, as you can see here, one slice for the end-to-end -end for Google or even in just the cloud. Also, for the, next, uh, for the rest of the services, it could be done in the different network nodes that we defined before. We can also have uh, different customization, different portions in the network with different configurations because of these strategies of the network operator. For example, they could have a different quality of service and network and different customization of the parameters. If we focus on the network slicing part, we can see that we will have a strong warranties in terms of the quality of service of the KPIs. And in the other portion, we can have the no customization, where it would be, a, where we, sorry, in the network slicing, we will have a strong quality of service parameters and KPIs warranties, but we will have no customization. However, we can have isolation in the lower level where the antennas are, and we will be able to multiplex, to multiplex the resources. Then the, the efficiency will be reduced there. But we will, will, will be able to have uh, this isolation resources uh, accommodated in, the, in a best effort fashion. And our objective is to have um, is to quantify the reduction of efficiency in terms of this trade-off between the customized resources and uh, the customized services and dedicated resources. So in order to quantify this efficiency, let me first introduce the model that we use. We have an infrastructure, like you can see in these slides, where several uh, slices could be defined along the different network nodes. For example, in the L equal to one, which is the antenna level, we can have one or more slices, and also in the rest of the network configuration, for example, in the cloud. Also, um, it's important that uh, as we move to the cloud, the traffic flows increase. 
But just let's focus in one node and one slice. One slice will generate a time series like this one. In, and we will select a reconfiguration time interval called tau. This tau is the time where the operator cannot change the defined resources allocated for uh, the customized uh, services. And it could be defined by NFB. So let's say that we take the nth interval tau and we put and we define a quality of uh, service requirement set. In order to know the resources allocated to this set, uh, we will freeze this threshold where I'm uh, just showing here the 98%, and it will be called R hat. So if we do this for the different slices, we will have something like this, and we will have for every, each of them the different quality of service, of service specification. If we sum all of them, we will be able to have the resources required to implement the slicing at node C under the specification set for the interval N. But in order to, co to compute the multiplexing efficiency, we also need to aggregate all the slices present in that node, all the time intervals uh, with the reconfiguration period fixed, and then we will have at level L uh, the resources required to implement slicing during the, under the specification set. And this will be called R, a capital R. But to compare this, we need a baseline, and the baseline is as follows. So we define in node C the reconfiguration time interval again, and we have these different slices. So if we aggregate them instant by instant in that tau, we will have an aggregated time series like in the slide. So if we define the very same quality of service specification, we will have something like this. So as you can see, R hat will be the minimum resources to accommodate the total demand at no C under set during the interval N. If we sum them, we will have uh, the perfect setting, and I will call this capital P, which means that we will have to relate this as in such a way that we can understand it. So the way we do it is a simple division like you can see here, and what it means. Well, if this number is equal to one, then we have the maximum efficiency because it will be the perfect sharing. And if we have, for example, 0 0.1, it means that we need 10 times the resources that we will need to achieve the perfect sharing. So moving on, let me introduce how it is the data set that we have. I will just present the case studies we have um, with the popular mobile services, with some of the popular mobile services. So we have two representative urban areas in an European country, and we have uh, just a large metropolis and a medium-sized city. The data is recorded by a major operator, mobile network operator, and the demands uh, generated are from uh, the 24th of September in 2016, and it covers three months. Also, we identify 38 services uh, uh, for the slices, but in order to, se to be selected, they have to fulfill two features. First one, they have uh, to generate a substantial demand over the 0.1% of the traffic generated in that location, and also they have to have a clear quality of uh, service requirements. For example, I have services like Snapchat, Pokemon Go, which was important in 2016, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, etc. And also here I show you in the graphs the large metropolis case with the percentage of traffic uh, in the y-axis and the service rank ordered in the x-axis, and the very same for the medium-sized city. Also I show here the uh, traffic directions, which are downlink and uplink with different colors. Moving on, um, we have uh, also 
to describe our hierarchical network infrastructure. Uh, structure, sorry. So basically, here are, are the two locations that we study, and the dots in the plots are the different uh, tenants that we have. So basically, we are at the level L equal to 1. But in order to generate uh, our model, we need to have uh, different levels deployed based on two characteristics. First one, the load balancing, because the offer load uh, should be similar in all the nodes. And also the latency, uh, which should be reduced. In order to do so, the nodes uh, serve sets of L minus one nodes in the geographical proximity. So in order to do this, we use the CAF heuristic, and we will have some results like this one. So as you can see, it's color maps to a different sector where the balance in, with the load is balanced in all of them, and they are close together uh, to, the, to do these antenna assignments. As you can see, I just present the case of four, eight, and 16 nodes, but you can see more implementations of uh, the different uh, levels in our paper. So, moving into the results, just let me introduce some of them because there are a lot, but hopefully I mean, you will get the idea. <laughs> so first, let me introduce the static case. The static case is the one where tau is equal to infinity. It means that the resources, once they are located, they will be fixed and there will be, they will not be able to change them. So this will give us a graph like this one. In the x-axis, you can see the normalized traffic demand, and in the y-axis, the maximum efficiency achieved. Also in the x-axis, on the top, uh, you can see the different levels that we have. In purple, there is the large metropolis, and in gold will be the medium-sized city. And also the gray dots are the L equal to one. It means the antenna level. So as you can see, since if we move from the antenna level to the, to the cloud, the efficiency increase. But actually, which is important, the, what is important is the, the numbers that this uh, shows. The efficiency is really low, around 50% in the network edge, which means that we need six times the dedicated resources for achieving the perfect sign. However, if we move to the core, we see that the efficiency is still low, um, we will achieve only a 60% of the a 60% of the maximum efficiency, which means that we will still need double the resources for for the core. So, uh, what we can also say is that the resources the results are consistent in the two urban scenarios, but. Now we have considered the static case. What happens if we have a dynamic case? Well, in order to do so, we need a reconfiguration time interval and we fix it in 30 minutes. And the graph is as follows. As you can see, uh, the axes are almost the same except the y-axis in the right, where I saw the perfect gain. The perfect gain is here shown in gray color with respect to the static case. And as you can see, the technology is enabling a flexible orchestration of resources allow four times the efficiency increase at the edge. Also, um, we need to still doubling the resources with respect to service differentiation, um, which will be a common situation. Finally, let me show you some examples when we vary some of the parameters that we need for this study. For example, if we vary the reconfiguration uh, interval span from 30 minutes to three months, we can see that the reconfiguration is beneficial only at time scales that are shorter than a few hours. Also, we can try to see what happens if we vary the number of slices that we define. And it's uh, present in the slides. As you can see, uh, I also saw in these uh, graphs the different uh, level that we define. The antenna level equal to one, the cloud level equal to capital L, and then one with nodes, which is the intermediate case. And in this one, with then decreasing the number of slices, we can see that only has effect when we are considering the top 10 services. Also, 
um, we can uh, change the warranty, uh, well, the quality of service requirement that we have, um, which, as you can see in the picture, it, uh, the quality of service specification must be uh, reduced a lot in order to have a high efficiency. But these are only some results. I encourage you to check the rest of them in the paper. So thank you very much for attending the conference. Um, if you have any question, please ask. And also is Marco Fiori in the audience, so we can also check out something later if you want to. So thank you very much. So the final talk of our session is uh, is Yan Huang from Virginia Tech. So he's going to talk about a GPU-based design to achieve about 100 microseconds scheduling for 5G NR, which is the 5G new radio. And he's going to talk about an interesting piece of how to do it in a GPU-based design. Jan is a PhD Sorry student yeah, from the EC department, and he receives his master's and bachelor's both from Beijing University of Post and Telecommunications. His research is on real-time optimization and algorithm design for wireless networks. With that, let's hear what Jan has to say. Thank you so, so much for the introduction. Uh, my name is Yan Huang, and I'm from Virginia Tech. Uh, this paper, GPF, is co-authored with Shao Ran Li, Professor Thomas Ho, and Professor Wen Jinglou. Uh, well, the centralized scheduling of radio resources is actually one of the most important enablers for cellular networks to achieve a high spectral efficiency. Uh, the uh, objective of a scheduler can be uh, maximizing the total throughput of a network, uh, can also be the, uh, maintaining the fairness among the users within a, a cell. Uh, in this work, we are focusing on the specific type of uh, schedulers, uh, which is called the proportional fair scheduler. Uh, so for this type of scheduler, our uh, objective is to maximize the proportional fairness among the users within the cell. Uh, this problem is actually uh, a very popular research topic through the years of uh, 3G and 4G communication technologies. But with the coming of uh, 5G new, new radio, uh, we, we are facing with a new challenge. Uh, uh, the challenge is that uh, the resolution for scheduling is decreased by 10 times compared with 4G LTE, from one millisecond reduced to uh, 100 microseconds. And in this work, our proposed solution to address this real-time challenge um, is to utilize the GPU-based parallel computing. Uh, so next, I will talk about this uh, scheduling problem and how we uh, use the GPUs to do the job. Uh, so what is 5G new radio? It is the next generation cellular communication te uh, technology. Uh, so uh, it has been developed with the target of supporting an e extreme diversity in use cases, and to be operated on a very broad uh, frequency spectrum. Uh, to enable such diversity, uh, the 5G physical air, in air interface is actually much more flexible than uh, 4G LTE. So what are the 5G use cases? Uh, there are three major categories. The first is uh, EMBB, which is short for Enhanced Mobile Broadband. And the second is MMTC, short for Massive Machine Tab Communications. And the third type is EYLLC, which is short for Ultra Reliable and Low Latency Communications. So a very important feature of these use cases is that uh, all these, diff all these uh, service tabs have totally different requirements uh, for the 5G network. For example, for EMBB, it requires a much higher throughput compared with 4G LTE. Well, for MMTC, um, it targets at providing over 1 million connections per square meter. Well, for URLLC, uh, it is expected to support less than 1 out of 100 million packet loss and to reduce the latency to the time scale of uh, 1 millisecond. Besides the diversity in service tabs, 
5G new radio will also face uh, ex extreme diversity in operating frequency. Uh, the 5G frequencies include the low bands, uh, which are lower than one gigahertz, and also the middle bands that are within one gigahertz to six gig gigahertz. It also has the mean meter wave bands, which are higher than 24 gigahertz. So what's the outcome of such uh, diversity in service types and operating frequencies? It turns out uh, the physical area in the interface of 5G new radio should be much more flexible than previous 4G LTE. And to enable such flexibility, a number of different OFDM numerologies are defined for 5G new radio. So what does numerology mean? OFDM numerology actually refers to the configuration of waveform parameters, such as the subcarrier spacing, which is the gap between two consecutive subcarriers, um, and also the duration of time slots, which are fixed to 14 OFDM uh, symbol durations. So uh, choosing the correct numerology to fit the uh, service type and operating frequency is actually very important uh, to meet the, the uh, to meet the target of uh, 5G new radio networks. Uh, here's a table of the OFDM numerologies defined for data transmission, uh, including numerology 0, 1, 2, and 3. And we can see that uh, the subcarrier spacing is increasing with numerology, while the time slot duration is decreasing. And in particular, we can see that under numerology 3, the duration of a time slot is only 125 microseconds. So what does it mean? It means that the time resolution, the minimum time resolution for scheduling under 5G will be on the time scale of 100 microseconds. And in this work, we are considering the proportional fire scheduling under this 100 microsecond time scale. And the target, uh, the objective uh, of the PF scheduling is to maximize the proportional fairness about the, uh, among the users in the cell, uh, which is defined as the sum of log of uh, long-term data rate of all users. So uh, what are the resources we're talking about uh, in terms of scheduling? We're actually al al allocating hundreds of resource blocks to tens or even hundreds of users per cell. And for each user, we need to select a specific uh, modulation and coding scheme, the short MCS, for its transformation. And the major challenge here is that we need to find a scheduling solution within 100 microseconds. Remember that uh, the time slot duration under numerology 3 is only 125 microseconds. However, the PF scheduling problem is actually NP-hard. And under practical network settings, the problem scale is re re really large. Uh, for example, we may have hundreds of re resource blocks, and in each cell, we may have tens or even hundreds of users. And for each user, we have 29 possible options of the mod modulation and coding schemes. And to the best of our no knowledge, there's no known PF schedulers designed for 4G LT that can meet this 100 microsecond time requirement. Um, now let, let's look at more details about this PF scheduling problem. Uh, so what does the resource on the channel look, look, uh, actually look like? Uh, it is actually organized into a two-dimensional resource grid. Uh, in a time domain, we have consecutive TTIs, which is short for transformation and time interval. And we consider the most challenging case where under, under numerology three, uh, a TTI equals to one time slot, which is only 125 microseconds. Uh, in frequency, we have hundreds of resource blocks for each TTI. Uh, and in each TTI, we need to allocate all these resource blocks to the users within the cell. Uh, besides the RB allocation, uh, the PF scheduler also needs to address the selection of MCS for each user's transmission. According to the 5G standard, there are a total number of 29 possible uh, modulation and coding schemes. Basically, on a resource block, uh, a higher level of MCS corresponds to a uh, higher spatial efficiency and also a higher transmission data rate. 
uh, but it also requires a better channel quality. Uh, in the ideal case, uh, for each resource block we allocate to a user, we may want to use a separate MCS for its trans transmission. But in, re in reality, uh, each user can only use one MCS uh, for each uh, transmission time interval across all the resource blocks. And the one reason for this is that uh, using multiple MCS uh, for each user will uh, dramatically increase the signaling overhead, but it will not uh, produce a significant improvement uh, in spectral efficiency. So what will happen under this constraint of one MCS per, per user? Uh, suppose that a user's channel condition varies across these uh, resource blocks, which means that it has a better channel quality on some blocks and may have poor channel quality on some other blocks. So if we're choosing a very high level of MCS, uh, we, we, which requires a, a very good quality, channel quality, uh, so this user may only have very few resource blocks that can uh, have a good data rate. On the majority of other resource blocks, its data rate will be zero, 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 zero. And if we choose a lower MCS level, which may require a not so good channel quality, so this user may have more resource blocks uh, that can contribute to non-zero data rate. But the trade-off here is that uh, the data rate on each resource block will be lower than the previous case. Uh, so along with the RB allocation and the, uh, the, the selection of M MCS, uh, this PF scheduling problem is actually very complex. Uh, re remember that uh, we have the uh, objective of maximizing the proportional fairness among the users of the cell, uh, and we are allocating hundreds of re resource blocks uh, to hundreds of users, and for each user we need to select a, a, a modulation and coding scheme for its transmission. And recall that we need to solve this problem, find a scheduling solution in the time scale of 100 microseconds. So uh, GPF is our proposed solution to address this real-time challenge. So how does uh, GPF actually works? It uh, consists of three parts. The first is problem decomposition, which will, will produce a large number of sub-problems. And the second step is, the, uh, is, is to select a, a subset of sub-problems to fit the number of available GPU cores. And the third part is GPU-based parallel computing for solving the selected sub-problems. So for the problem decomposition, we're actually decomposing the original PF scheduling problem into a very large number of sub-problems. So how do we do this? We are actually fixing the MCLEX setting for each user. And by doing this, uh, for example, if we have K users, this will result in a total number of 29 to the power of K sub-problems. And for each sub-problem, so we are allocating the result blocks to users under the given uh, MCS configurations for all users. Apparently, the total number of sub-problems is much larger than the available, of course, for any real-world GPU. So the, uh, it's, it's a natural, yeah, it's a na natural solution that we can only select a small set, subset of sub-problems and fit into the available number of GPU cores. So how does, how does GPF actually work? Um, instead of generating all of the sub-problems, we, we are only generating and solving 300 sub-problems uh, in parallel in G GPU. Uh, because of uh, the small number of sub-problems, so the question is, how can we still achieve near optimality with such a small subset of sub-problems? Well, the science behind the GPF is a simple trick uh, of probability. Uh, uh, assume that uh, each sub-problem solution has a very small probability to offer a near op optimal uh, solution. And let Q uh, denote the probability of having a at least one of the 300 sub-problems that are offering near optimal solution. And the Q can be calculated as shown in this slide. By looking at Q as a function of P, we can see that uh, we only need a very small P to ensure a very large Q. 
for 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 example, uh, we only need uh, each sub problem solution to have a probability of 1.6 percent to ensure that uh, overall we will have uh, over 99 percent prob probability to achieve near optimality. And how do we do the uh, selection of sub problems? Uh, there are two steps. The first step uh, is through intensification. The basic idea is that we are focusing the search of solution uh, on a promising subspace instead of the entire problem space. And uh, there are many ways to do this. Uh, for GPF, what we do is to re reduce the uh, MCS choices per user. For example, if we only take the uh, highest three feasible MCS levels for all users, this will reduce the total number of sub-problems uh, to three to the power of k. But obviously, uh, for like 100 users, this number is still too, too large. So the second step, we need to do a uniformly random sampling over the promising subspace. And we are only taking 300 sub-problems from this promising subspace. And will this uh, selection of, uh, of sub-problems uh, work, work well? Uh, uh, the answer is yes. So from an experiment uh, for 100 users, we can see that uh, with probability uh, of uh, 3%, each sub-problem can offer a near-optimal sol solution. Uh, here the optimality is over 99%. So that implies uh, with one, 300 sub-problems, we are almost surely to achieve a near optimality. And uh, our imp imp implementation of GPF uh, is based on NVIDIA Core p 6000 GPU and the CUDA uh, programming model. And on this GPU, uh, we can generate and solve 300 sub-problems in parallel in, uh, for each transformation time interval. Uh, so how, 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 how is uh, GPF actually implemented? Uh, here we have a host and GPU architecture. Uh, at the beginning of each transformation time interval, uh, the input data is prepared by the host, and then uh, it, it is transferred to the uh, GPU over the PCIe interface. Uh, when the input data is uh, ready at the GPU's global memory, we are running a uh, CUDA kernel to generate and solving all the sub problems. Yeah. Uh, so for m more details about the design of this GPU kernel, please read the paper. Uh, when we finally get a sol solution on GPU, uh, we need to transfer it back to the host for scheduling the resources. Uh, here I want to talk a little bit about uh, how well GPF, GPF can act actually work. Uh, uh, for 100 resource blocks and 20, 29 MCS choices per user, uh, and a, a number of users ranging from 25 to 100, we can see that uh, GPF can consistently uh, find your optimal uh, solution within, uh, within our uh, 100 microsecond time re requirement. And by, by further breaking down the execution time of GPF, uh, we can see that uh, the computation on GPU only takes uh, less than 40% of the total scheduling time. And the data transferring between host and GPU actually uh, takes the majority of, of the execution time. So what does it mean? It means that if we can have an integrated host and GPU architecture uh, without data transferring uh, over the PCIe interface, we may be able to achieve an even shorter scheduling time. Uh, that is all I present. Thank you very much.